everybody and welcome to our panel on energy and sustainability. It's really my pleasure to bring our panelists together and to chair this session. I'm very proud to be chairing it from my home in New Zealand as New Zealand has such an outstanding record for uh, its track record in renewable energy. It was also my pleasure to arrange for a small clip from our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Uh, we are privileged to be doing very, very well in COVID-19 because of our very scientific uh, data-driven approach. So I'd like to start out by introducing our panellists. Our first panellist is Xin Ma. Xin is Managing Director of Total Carbon Neutrality Ventures. So that means she's pivotal to Total's role to become a responsible energy major. Total has invested in at least 35 global startups in a range of energy sectors. Shin has a PhD in petroleum economics from the University of Dundee. And our next panelist yeah. is Leslie Go, who's a senior technology advisor at the World Bank Group. Cambridge Judge Business School Fellow at the National University of Singapore. She's had an amazing career in the private sector with organisations such as Martin Deloitte. She's got an interest in AI, blockchain, IoT, 5G. She's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Data Policy, which promotes innovative thinking and shapes a sustainable future for us all. And then our fourth panelist is Nida Rizwan Farid, who is the owner and founder of her own startup, NRF Engineering. Nida has worked in the US, the United Arab Emirates, and in Switzerland. She returned to Pakistan in 2012 to found a consultancy, which among other things, works on energy conservation, education, and energy audits. Nida has a PhD in aerospace from MIT. So welcome everybody. No. Thank you. Um, sorry. To be here. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to clarify, I have a bachelor's in aerospace from MIT and a master's in mechanical energy uh, engineering from ETH in Switzerland. Oh, oh <laughs> my, my apologies. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I find fascinating about data and data science is the storytelling aspect of data science, that data, uh, data science done well should really communicate. Um, so perhaps I'd like to start with a question for Punida around what data has been most powerful for you in communicating a message? Um, I think for me, that's the, the energy flow diagram in Pakistan. Um, so as I mentioned, I did my master's in Switzerland at ETH, and I worked with uh, Professor Eckhart uh, Jochen, and um, he's one of the energy policy and economics professors there. And uh, that's where I got introduced to the tool of energy flow diagrams, which is used a lot um, in Europe and in other de uh, developed countries, but it's not used here in Pakistan, right? Um, and uh, for a long time, we've had an energy crisis here in Pakistan, a big dif uh, difference between supply and demand, even 30 or 40 percent of the difference in supply and demand. And um, the message always has been, or the understanding always has been, that it's a supply issue, right? Uh, but my, my hypothesis was that it's actually an energy efficiency issue. And I only realized this once I moved back to Pakistan in 2012. Um, especially after Switzerland, you know, you see a stark difference in energy efficiency between Switzerland and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I noticed the amount of energy that was being wasted everywhere. And uh, so I decided, uh, so I was enrolled into the energy experts group to put together the integrated energy plan for Pakistan. And in that, um, I decided to actually do the energy flow diagram um, for Pakistan. In the end, we didn't get the resources to do all of this, uh, but I ended up, you know, doing it myself, collecting all the data myself. 
And uh, once I plotted the energy flow diagram for Pakistan, we actually saw that we were wasting uh, more than 83% of the energy that was being supplied to us. Right. And that was a huge shock for us, honestly, for me to see that data so starkly there in that Sankey diagram, the energy flow diagram. <laughs> it was it was a really, really stark thing. And then when we saw that the other members of the when the other members of the group saw the same diagram, uh, suddenly the energy efficiency chapter, instead of being the last chapter in the entire integrated energy plan for Pakistan, became the first one after um, you know the su the summary and the initial uh, uh, introductory chapters. So um, that was a big deal. Uh, the interesting part was that uh, when we showed this to the government at that point in time, they honestly they refused to believe it. So uh, the reaction was first that they fell off their chairs when they saw it, and then they said these are all lies. Right, uh, because no government wants to see somebody showing them that you know 83% of the energy that we're supplying is being wasted. Uh, but then we had a change of government, and this time our government was a completely new party. Right, so for them it felt like okay, we are starting with a clean slate, and to them it was easy to accept this, and they they wanted as much data as possible um, that showed them what the steps they need to do uh, or ne they need to take our right so i really feel this energy flow diagram has been um, really pivotal but not just for me but uh, for other people in the energy sector here who have been following a very flawed sense of what the problem or what the crisis in pakistan actually is and uh, it's not a supply problem it's a wastage problem and, and the energy flow diagram helped me um, show that to the government. Yeah. Great, thank you for sharing that, Nita. I saw a, a copy of that diagram as we were preparing, and it really does tell a story. Um, Jean, I'd also like to sort of ask you a similar question around what data has been most powerful for you in terms of communicating in the work that you do. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosaline. I think in, in our sector, the energy sector, there are so much data is producing these days. But before I speaking to, to a person uh, to explain about the unprecedented energy transition that we are having these days, I just like to pull out some very simple data. So first of all, I share with them, uh, you know, there are still at our days, um, 700, more than 700 million people has no access to energy. And on top of that, from here to 2050, we're still going to adding 2 billion people to the world population. So all this means that we need more energy and better energy. And another set of data I like to share, also very simple figures, is every year there are 50 billion tons of greenhouse gas are added. And this needed to be dropped to zero by 2050, so we are going to still avoid the climate disaster. And just to put everything in the proportion, 80% of the carbon emission are coming from the energy sector, from industry, from um, agriculture, transportation, but they are all from energy sector. So that really shows how extremely important the energy transition is now and this actually is going to helping us from the now kind of more fossil fuel based energy system to a better system, more decarbonized with less uh, fossil fuel, with more renewable energy, uh, with solar and wind and hydrogen and biofuel. And at the same time, we need a better digital system, better energy storage system, um, and also to, to have the carbon capture and storage to overall bring us to a future and a better and decarbonized energy system. Pass to you, Rosaline. Great, thank you. Yes, I mean, some of those very simple metrics around just how compelling the need for a transition are um, does compel people to, to think very carefully about the technology options we have and the societal options that we have. 
Leslie, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Some of the material that you shared with me as we prepared uh, talked about ways to access governmental data. So um, would you like to make some, some comments on some of the tools that are available to access different data sets? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and also to learn from the esteemed speakers here. Um, I work in the emerging markets with governments and policymakers on digital transformation at the intersection of technology and innovation and policy framework. Um, and the sectors I work in um, primarily in financial sector, fintech, digital government, and most recently agriculture. In 2020, during the COVID lockdown, I spent most of my time researching into the opportunities to unlock data technology innovation in agriculture and sustainability and examining the pathways through which digital technology can accelerate the transformation of agri-food system and doing it in a sustainable way. And one of which is around the use of data to illuminate the challenges uh, in the uh, sustainable uh, uh, development goals. And I like the story that um, the two other esteemed speakers have talked about. And one of the challenge I've seen in the space on data uh, is that, uh, especially where we, we share data across you know, government agencies and also between government and private sector, is that many of the data are locked in their own space and there is no protocol or ease of um, sharing in a secure manner. And so the whole data sharing platform actually examines uh, opportunities where there is one uh, data for public good that could be shared in a secure manner. For instance, at the World Bank Group, we publish um, quite readily a lot of the data, key data points for development data. And in fact, in the coming weeks or months, we should be publishing our World Development Report um, 2021 um, that talks about data for better lives. Um, the, in the space on data sharing, uh, we also have data collaboration across um, public and uh, private sector as well for research and um, the various kinds of development impact. Um, and we also do a lot of work in the energy space, uh, for instance, in the energydata.info, where we put together a lot of the data sets that are readily available for um, the analysis and research. Um, and recently we published the Python package group for the world development, uh, world, world bank data um, for easy access of this information. So these are just a few examples where there is the potential of leveraging data platform in a secure manner, um, leveraging upon the uh, research and innovations from government and international organization uh, for collaboration. Great, thank you. And I'm sure we can put links to some relevant material on how to access those Python packages, for example, into the chat once we're back on the hop-in window. But in many ways, your story around leveraging access to data and getting access to data brings me back to Tanita's story because to build the energy flow diagram for Pakistan, Nita was operating in a data desert. There simply wasn't the data she needed. So Nita, do you want to offer some thoughts on, on how, how you pulled the data together to do what you were able to do? So um, actually, the, the first set of data was uh, not as difficult to, to get when I think about it right now. Okay, I put three or four months into it. Um, from seven in the morning till midnight every day, weekends included. But uh, I realized at the end of it that uh, although I was pulling data from, from customs and I was pulling data from the Bureau of Statistics and I was pulling data from the Pakistan Energy Yearbook and, and many other sources, I realized to at least get from primary energy till final energy, this data was being collected by two basic uh, groups in Pakistan, which is uh, the, the Electricity Regulatory Authority, NEPRA, they had it, and the Hydrocarbon Institute, they had it. Um, so that was fine. My main challenge was how to get demand side data, you know, the behavior of consumers and things like that. So initially I had used the, the global 
energy assessment and I'd assume that Pakistan has the same average consumer efficiencies. But um, honestly speaking, I felt scared about collecting the data for Pakistan itself on the demand side. I thought we had just too little data. I won't be able to find enough. And then I attended the, the energy, so they have this energy efficiency workshop for emerging economies at the International Energy Agency. So I attended that uh, a few summers back. And there I realized that no one has enough data. Okay, uh, when you think about it, everyone is in a little bit of a data desert and everyone has to make a lot of guesstimates to get to the final. Uh, result right so you do have to fill in a lot of blanks yourself and honestly that gave me a lot of confidence because I realized that you just have to look really hard for where you can get data that will allow you to make good assumptions right so in the end I was able to then put full demand side data from the industry from the consumer sector etc um, through different sources. For industry, for instance, just as an example, um, I could get an example of the automobile industry by pulling data from uh, to the local Toyota factories, right, uh, in Pakistan, because, because Toyota forces them to share how much energy they use per car. So the local assemblers here in Pakistan, they are forced to share that data too. So just like that, in every industrial sector, we had some factories sharing some amount of data, right? So that allowed us to piece together the data for industry. Similarly, in all the other sectors, domestic or commercial, agriculture, etc. cetera. Uh, so in the end, I think that the, Taking that leap of faith that, no, you know what, I will be able to find certain bits of information and, you know, piece them together to get my picture. And then sort of show that data to lots of different groups of people, to professors, to universities, to uh, energy departments, to other companies, to see if they think that the data and the assumptions behind them are valid. You know, get them proved, get those assumptions proved. And that allows you to still come to some of a, you know, some kind of a picture that you can share with the world. And in places like Pakistan, especially where you have too little data, uh, people like us in the private sector are forced to sort of get our hands dirty, go there and do all of this ourselves because we can't find that data otherwise. So we do have to do it ourselves. And a lot of times it ends up being free work, honestly, because we need it for our work. So we end up doing it. Uh, but yeah, I don't think data desert is something that is uh, just in Pakistan. It's everywhere in the world. Uh, but you learn ways to deal with it. Yeah. Back to you, Rosie. Thank you, Nita. Yes, I think you've had an incredible amount of courage and conviction to yeah. work your way through that data desert and, and use that data to tell stories. Um, I'd like to come back to, to Shin and to think about the role of data science in decarbonisation. So the sort of data that you started with when I commented on storytelling um, makes it very clear we need to decarbonise. But do you have any thoughts on the role of decarbonisation, particularly in the, in the corporate setting that you're in, in, in supporting our efforts to decarbonise? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, to decarbonize uh, the industry and the society, we really need everybody to work together, the government, the companies and the public. The good thing is we have a big momentum and that people are willing to do so. Um, but uh, I think I, I was very inspired by the story from Nida. It, that's also what I see from my day to day investment activities when I deal with startups in, in, in the Asia and Asia Pacific. So notably, I work a lot with startups in Southeast Asia and India. So what, what I see is very interestingly, at the same time, we're operating a data lake, where a lot, a lot of data, raw data being produced, especially in these countries, it's driven by the mobile network. But at the same time, um, you really are extremely lack of data, lack of structured data, lack of meaningful data, lack of uh, data that has been cleaned and prepared and uh, can serve the system. 
So I probably just give a couple examples that I've seen in my industry. So uh, lately, I've been speaking to a startup in India in the uh, plastic recycling industry. So we, we all know that pl plastic is a big environmental hazard, and uh, Asia is contributing a big part of it. So eight, eight out of 10 rivers um, are in Asia that all the 10 rivers produce 90% of the plastic that go into the sea. Just put things into proportion. So. Um, thanks to the wonderful uh, remarkable job of the informal pickers who who does it for a living in india actually majority of the plastic are recycled in this country but uh, the challenge is really to um to have the good quality recycled plastic because if you don't have a good data especially at the consumer side you know the so-called distributed data which are really scattered everywhere if you don't have good structured data of all this have a wider view all you can do is mix everything all types of plastic all qualities and recycle them because they are mixed they lost some kind of uh, their properties they can only be used for some low uh, category use so what the startup do is they are really doing a bit like Nida. They are hiring people to work on the street. They are helping those informer pickers to really know and separate, categorize what type of feedstock they are collecting. By doing this, by doing this like a digital platform, they are, we, they are able to have a meaningful way to digitalize their collection system and being able to really recycle plastic in different ways that is meeting the high criteria from big brand owners such as Coca-Cola and Unilever. So that's really a, a, a remarkable story that I have seen. I think the second story is about uh, the grid because what we know is part of the story of we going to the uh, renewable, uh, like cleaner future is to we need to add more renewable energy to the grid. So the grid has transforming from like the big system, the the, the gas, the, the coal, and the petroleum uh, big power plant in the in the past, which is easier to manage, easier to plan. To the future, uh, with more renewable energy, with more distributed users. So that means more segmented and difficult to forecast, especially for countries like India with very weak grid system that can actually bring more um, problems and uh, blackout. So there are startups that are working on this, not only from supply side, they can focus the patterns of the production of wind and solar, and also from demand side, they can try to focus the patterns of the, you know, how people are going to consume their, their energy from the weather, from the festival and everything. And by digital means, just make the physical system more uh, robust, and more resistant. So that's really wonderful stories. I've seen how the data science can really helping us to move into a better like energy system in the future. Pass you to Rosaline. Thank you, Jim. I mean, those stories really do give me hope. The idea that the majority of plastic in, in India can be recycled is being recycled and that's being supported through data gathering efforts, you know, really gives me hope that we can make the kinds of changes that we need in the world. Um, I'd like to ask a similar question of, of Leslie around the role of data and data science from a, a government perspective, because I know you engage a lot with, with governments in the sector. Thank you so much. Um, data science is uh, a very important part of the discipline to illuminate the problem by quantifying the main causes of climate uh, challenges to address decarb decarbonizing of energy sector. And But more needs to be done, as you hear from all my esteemed speakers here, about data harmonization, the tools, uh, frameworks in particular, and creating that kind of standards, uh, not just for data sharing, but also for reporting to show the progress around the world. Um, data on climate issues remain a mixed bag uh, by uh, many uh, standards and also the, create, the kind of uh, harmonization requires key decision makers to, uh, especially from the policy maker side, where they are embarking on net zero standards and strategy to see what are the tools and the policy that could incentivize the private sector to come forward with the accurate reporting 
and metrics and information systems that are established in a form of indicators to measure the progress is important. Um, just looking very closely at some of the countries that have gone further in this space, uh, I'm going to quote an example for Singapore um, because uh, this is where my birth country is, but also the areas around the use of technology um, to drive home the key capabilities around sustainability. And Singapore just published the um, Green Plan, which I highly encourage you to have a look on the whole of government approach to uh, energy and also sustainability uh, for the whole entire country. So we're looking forward to see how this is an example of the use of data and technology at a country level to make that happen from a government perspective and also that creating enabling environments for the private sector to step in for collaboration as well. Thank you. I might move back to, to Jin and ask a couple of things kind of packaged together. Firstly, are there particular tools and techniques? You know, we'll have people on the line that really love algorithms and packages. So are there particular technical tools that have been the most useful for you? And I think while you have the floor, any comments you want to offer just to give some advice? What advice would you give to somebody who wants to pursue a data-driven career in the energy sector? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think very quickly, um, there's not one set of data and one set of tools. Energy transition is such a massive mission and uh, we really need everything. Um, and there, I just give probably again two small examples. Um, you know, it, overall, if we want to uh, have the energy transition and cut the carbon emission, we have to cut it where the cost is lowest. Um, but for example, the recent very well intentioned policy in Berlin, and they subsidize the, the bikes and the cargo bikes. And actually, what they cost is 50,000 euro per ton of CO2. But you can do that in much better in the smaller industry. So that data can help you on that. And the second one is other things. I think I very timely, I seen just a modeling out of the MIT. And they say, if you want to um, do things well to decarbonize other matters, for example, if we develop electric mobility ahead of the energy, uh, renewable energy, and then we are going to just uh, have um, less uh, renewable energy to the system because um, electric mobility, if we want to satisfy them, we need to burn more coals. So all these things are very hopeful, help, helping us to go in the future. I really want to tell the data scientist to be really sure that there are so much that the data science can add to this energy transition that is actually playing a major role on a major stage to helping us to a better and low carbon future. Pass to you, Rosalie. Thank you very much. Yes, order does does matter. As, yeah. as the driver of an electric car, yeah. I make sure that I'm <laughs> doing it in a country that's powered by renewable energy. Uh, Nida, I might ask you a similar question yeah. around whether there are, are tools and techniques in your toolbox that are the most sort of powerful for you and what yeah. advice you to someone who wants a data-driven career in the energy sector. I would actually back up Shin here. Uh, what's really important is to understand what can you get with the minimum amount of uh, investment. Right, so I like to focus on the low hanging fruit. After we have the data, then focus on the low hanging fruit. Um, apart from the Sankey diagram, most of my work has been with standard Excel sheets and standard survey forms and things like that. Surveys are really important in, in collecting the data. Uh, but I think more than data, we, we need to focus on the storytelling perspective. Uh, we are people who have an engineering background and an economics background and, and a background that focuses on data. But the majority of the people out there who need to work with our data are not like that, right? So the storytelling perspective of data is really important. 
and understanding how to, to show this data in a visual way, to, to show it in the form of a story so that it, it gets the interest, in, interest of our audience, right? And, uh, and to understand when too much data, when we are showing too much data to the audience, right? So I think that perspective is incredibly important in making use of our data, the storytelling part of it. Yeah. Now back to you. <laughs> Absolutely, that takes us right, right back to the beginning of the session where I kind of underline mm -hmm. the storytelling power of data. It brings us to a close as well. I'd like to thank you all for spending time with Women in Data Science. I'm sure the audience out there has really appreciated. So thank you all. Thank you.